Hi, everyone. This is Jennifer Bagnashi with Deep Believer. Today, our guest has something fantastic to share with us. It is fascinating. It is relevant, but not as relevant as it's going to be. And you'll understand as we continue on. John Green saw the tribulation. He saw things up close. He saw the stars falling to the earth. He saw how the mountains will be flattened. And you're going to want to see this. You're going to want to hear it. I mean, this is something that I'm actually really excited about. Something that needs to be shared for such a time as this. John Green, thank you so much for being on today. Thank you very much, Jennifer. It's such a great joy for me to be here once again. And a big hello to all your audience around the world. And yes, it's going to be very exciting to be able to share with you what the Lord has been showing me as I've been studying the book of Revelation. So John Green, last time you were on, you did fantastic. You spoke about how you went to heaven and how you were in haunted houses. And you you explained to us how it is important to uh, cover your home. And it is important to have that relationship with Jesus. And you have not Amen. because you asked not, which is why you perceive these visions. So tell us, we're focusing on the tribulation. And yes, we are in the end days. That's it's no doubt about that. What is the tribulation for those who have no idea what the tribulation is? Well, yes, that's a great question, Jennifer. And I think uh, the Bible is very clear about this topic and especially about this word tribulation. Now, of course, the Lord did say to the disciples, you will have trials and you'll have challenges in life and life will be tough. But we're not talking about that. We're particularly talking about a period of time. The tribulation is a seven year period of time that is yet future. But very, very soon, it's a period of time just after the rapture that it will begin here on earth. It's going to be global. It's going to affect the whole world. And the duration of this period is only seven years. And then comes the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, imagine if the if the tribulation were to start for example, in the next now, I'm not, we're not putting dates because the Lord does not give us dates, but the Lord does and he has given us signs for us to look at very carefully. And those signs are just telling us we're right at the doorstep of the beginning of these last seven years of the period of the Gentiles. The word of God speaks about that of our world that's been governed, you know, by the governments of the world, that's going to come to an end at the end of these seven years because then it'll be Christ ruling upon this world and he's coming to reign. He's coming to bring justice and holiness and to put everything right. Uh, but the tribulation is a seven-year period that's coming very, very soon. And let me tell you something. The Lord himself even spoke about his coming. And just before the seven years that are going to start very soon, he said in Matthew chapter 24, he gave several signs for us to see that we are at the doorstep. What are some of those signs that you need to understand in chapter 24 from verses 5 to verse 14? You can look it up in your Bibles, and then you can even pause this as you're listening and open your Bibles. Uh, but there it tells us that there's going to be deception by false teachers. And uh, that's growing more and more today. False teachers are appearing around the world. We even have a Messiah here in, in Australia, in Queensland, that says he's the Christ. And people are following him and they're false Christ. So Wait, it's gonna John, be John, really quickly. I didn't know about a false messiah out there in Australia. Could you tell yeah, us a little oh, bit yeah. about that? Yeah, well, you know, he was on he was on TV. I think he was a current affair even just a few years ago. And they interviewed him and he was proclaiming to be the the Christ who is now here on earth. But he's not the only one. There are many false messiahs that have are proclaiming themselves to be Christ. A few there in Latin America, uh, in America, in the USA. But here in Australia, 
we have one and there are believe it or not there are people that are following him he has a following and uh it's just crazy what's happening but there's nothing new about this because the lord says there will be false christs and false teachers you see when we're going to see christ he's coming back in glory he's coming the whole world will see him at the second coming of christ and uh, he's not hiding somewhere uh today uh that's not what the bible teaches us but uh satan has placed these things in our world to deceive mankind and that's why he works satan works through his emissaries that are false teachers false christ but there's another sign from verse six to seven that speaks about nation will rise against nation haven't we seen that in the past year, the past two years, the past five years, nations and uh, the upheaval that's happening in our world today. Then the Lord said in verse 7 of Matthew 24, there's going to be even devastation of food supply. I mean, even in the pandemic, what we had just now, people were running and, and <laughs> you couldn't get what you wanted. You were going to the shopping, uh, you know, the mall, the shopping center, and uh, it's incredible. And there is a shortage of food right now. Imagine just by a pandemic, how that stopped the world globally and how everything is backtracked now. Even the construction um, industry, there are places that don't even have nails. They, they're waiting for, you know, for the most common and, and, and smallest things that we normally use for construction. Everything's backlogged. And that was caused by one disease one virus imagine and that's in verse 7 too where it says in matthew 24 a disease in various places around the world we already seen that we've lived it i mean for two years and that's just one thing of the escalation of what's happening these are signs of the lord's soon return and then the disasters around the world we've seen that more an incrementation of earthquakes and more storms severe storms and Many severe things that are happening around the world that are not normal. Uh, you're getting snow in places that it's never snowed before. You're getting all sorts of the reaction of the very world of our earth is just um, running in such a, a dire way and, and causing all these things to happen. Then in verse 7, again, disasters around the world. Death for the sake of Christ in verse 9. Many are being martyred today around the world. You would think no, that can be happening in our world. Yes, it's been happening uh, around our world. I've seen videos of pastors in India being burnt alive. And this has just been recently. And, and we see deaths of Christians and deaths for the sake of Christ in many nations today. I visited Pakistan and Pakistan in Karachi in 2000, um, 2010, the fervency and the, 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 the great faith of believers is so strong in these places because it's, you're either a Christian, you, you live or you die when you manifest yourself as a Christian. So the, the, the faith of believers in so many of these countries is so strong. The commitment is so massive. Uh, because you, you can't play around with Christianity, and yet there are many, many who are giving their lives for the sake of Christ. Even today, they're being martyred, and the Lord already spoke about this. The disloyalty, even between friends and people, people are going to turn against each other. You know, even if you're saying, I believe in Christ, and I believe in the Lord Jesus, and I believe in heaven, and I believe in hell, I believe in the Word of God, we're being persecuted. The Christian uh, Christians today, even by our governments in so many places, were being persecuted, and uh, and this is happening today. This is not something of the future, and we're we're, we're going through these things right now, and, and and of course the false religions around the world. In verse eleven, the Lord spoke about that. There'll be many false religions around the world. There's going to be a defection from the faith. In other words, people, many people are turning away from the faith in verse 12 of Matthew 24. And then, of course, uh, the Lord says, even amongst all of these things, the gospel will be preached around the world. And then the end will come. And even the gospel will be preached in the tribulation, the last seven years before the coming of the Lord Jesus. Even then, the gospel will be preached to the whole world, and more than ever today through social media, 
You can preach that gospel. You can share your faith. You can share your testimony to people. And that is an ongoing thing. Once you record it on YouTube, it stays there and it's wonderful. And this is what uh, the Lord is saying. All of these things that are previous to the tribulation, we are living it right now. It's just raw. It's real. It's in front of us more than ever. We're coming to a cashless society very soon. Uh, cashless society. Everything's moving rapidly, much more rapidly than you think. And evil will spread without limits during this time of the tribulation. There will be diseases. There will be natural disasters, wars, devastation, all sorts of things within this period called the tribulation and that's that's just a, a little idea so you may understand that when you come to read the book of revelation just so you can have an understanding of what we're talking about if you just uh, if you have your bible there just look at it in in chapter one for example it speaks about the glorified christ uh, john the apostle sees a glorified christ and he glorifies his name the apostle john when he sees him he sees his glory from chapter two to three you see the message of Christ to the church. The Lord has a message for the church. And there are seven churches mentioned here. Of course, there were more churches. But this is a message to the church. So he who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church. And this is so important and powerful for us today to listen to the message and to read and study the book of Revelation. Don't be afraid of it. Come and study it because the Lord is going to bless you. But then in chapter 4 and 5, for example, of uh, the book of uh, Revelation, is adoration in heaven. Because here, uh, John is invited to, he's taken up into heaven, and he sees heaven, and he sees the Lord, he sees the multitudes of saints, and millions of saints, and the 24 elders, and he sees the angels, and he sees the uh, the throne of God, and he sees the adoration and the worship in heaven. This is chapter 4 and 5. But then from chapter 6 all the way to the beginning of chapter 19. And if you put uh, those pages in your hand, in your Bible, and you hold that right there, that's just a few pages, all of that space from chapter 6 to chapter 19 is the period called the tribulation. And this is where we can know exactly what is going to happen in those seven years. And it's all in between there, right? That means that the church is not mentioned in here from chapter 6 to 19 because the church has been raptured, has been taken to be with the Lord. And other things are happening with us there in heaven. Uh, wonderful things. But from chapter 6 to chapter 19, we see... Uh, very clearly there, the tribulation, this period of seven years, and what it means for those that are going to be there here on earth. And then in chapter 19 is the second coming of Christ. And then chapter 20 speaks to us about the millennium and how Satan is bound for a thousand years and Christ is ruling here on earth from Jerusalem, not from Sydney, not from uh, China. It's going to be in Jerusalem. And that's why your president made it, and that was prophetic, how your president made Jerusalem the capital for that nation, because it, it is from Jerusalem where the temple will be built very soon. They've got everything ready. The temple will be built for the Jewish people, the Jewish nation, and that temple will be the place where they're going to, again, uh, worship the Lord as they did in the Old Testament in the Temple of Solomon, and they're preparing that for the Messiah. And guess what? When the Lord King Jesus comes back, he's going to go back and, and be adored in, even in that temple. And uh, that's all prepared for the Lord. But that's in chapter um, uh, chapter 20. And then, of course, chapter 21 and 22, which I love reading time and time again. It speaks about Jennifer, the new heaven and new earth. I love it. Hallelujah. And I love it. <laughs> so that's, that's how you look at the book of Revelations. It was so... Simple, a little, we were flying over it, yes? Chapter yes. 1, and then chapter 2 and 3, the church, and then chapters 
four and five were in heaven with John and where they were glorifying the Lord. And of course, so many amazing teachings mm -hmm. in every verse of the Bible here in this book. But chapter six to 19, this is a period that's called the period of the tribulation, the mm -hmm. time of Jacob's trouble. Yes? yes. And I'll tell you the purpose of that in a minute, but that's so you can understand that. Yes. Well, John, I want to get to something really quickly. And I'm really, really glad you touched on this, how mm -hmm. you mentioned how John went to heaven. You're John yes. too. You went to heaven, but we're talking about John in the Bible, how it John, <laughs> John went to heaven yes. because you'll hear a lot of people um, who says, and who quotes Bible verses that says, no man has gone to heaven. No man has ascended into heaven. But yet you hear in Revelation or you read in Revelation that John went to heaven. So what is your response to that? Well, not only John, Paul, the apostle went to heaven. He went to the third heaven. And he explains that very clearly in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. What happens is this. Uh, you know how Paul then says, okay, and there were things that I saw that I could I could not share. I could not. So people just stick on to that and they say, all right. If he went to heaven, he did not share anything. Therefore, we mustn't talk about it. No, no, no. Because in the context, the battle with Paul was also pride. And the Lord, um, he did reveal many things about heaven, Paul. But the Lord knows when things need to be declared and open up, right? And um, But with John and many others in the Bible, uh, in the Old Testament too, even prophets, Ezekiel saw the glory of God. You know, uh, both as I saw the Lord and, and 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 the throne of God, and they had a vision, open vision of heaven. I mean, uh, you can have an open vision right now where I'm I'm right here in my office in my room, and the back wall, the Lord can remove that, and I can step into that heavenly realm and see the throne room and see everything. For God, we we sometimes judge the Lord so wrongly because for Him nothing is impossible. Right, Amen. Nothing is impossible. Our denomination and our theology is what has been limiting us. And that's where the problem is. And and I know that I used to be there myself. So I, I understand your, your concerns. But you know what? Uh, again, I will tell you, I was limiting the Lord. And, um, and because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And John was taken to heaven, not once, but many times while he was in the Isle of Patmos. This Isle of Patmos was a place where they would take prisoners. And uh, John was such an elderly man. He was in his 90s when he was in that island there. And the Lord would take him to heaven and show him many things. And then, you know, in his spirit, right? Now, of course, if you're in heaven in our flesh, you can't cope. Your flesh, sinful flesh, cannot cope there because, it, one, it is sinful. Uh, two, uh, no sin goes into heaven, right? And we know that. But uh, three, our bodies need to be glorified if our body and spirit are going to be there, just like the body of Christ when he rose again. He said, look, touch me. I'm not a ghost. Uh, I'm flesh, uh, you know, and I've got bones and Thomas was able to touch him on the side in his hands, but his body was glorified and his body with his spirit inside of him was glorified. He could go through walls. He could appear and disappear. You know, his body was ready to be in heaven, just like your body uh, is going to be ready at the resurrection. But when I die, my spirit goes back to the Lord. And even there, he says that John was in his spirit when the Lord told him, come up and see these things. So. Uh, yes, John had a marvelous, wonderful revelation uh, of the Lord. And even John and and, and uh, James and Peter, remember, at the Mount of Transfiguration, the Lord mm -hmm. opened heaven up and they saw at that mountain transfiguration while they were in a physical place, they could see the glorified Christ with Elijah and Moses next to them. That was heaven at the very footstep of that mountain, but it just transformed before them. Amen. And, and and only God can do that. Really quickly, because I know people are wondering this. What do you yeah. think the Lord was pertaining to when he said no man has ascended to heaven? Because there are people who are still stuck on that right now as we're saying this. Yeah. What do you believe the Lord was pertaining to when he mentioned Well, that? look, uh, what, uh, number one, you can only go to heaven 
if the Lord ushers you into heaven. You can't go by yourself. You can't you can't just usher yourself because we live in this environment in this place. So you can't usher yourself into heaven. Uh, but when the Lord does usher you into heaven, it's because He's got He is God and He's got the ability to do that. And just just like that. Although we live here on earth, and this is our natural habitat and natural place, but as Christians and as children of God, remember, one of the giftings that we have and blessings is that we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. So I know that's hard to understand because you're saying, but how can that be? I am here, yes. But in the spiritual dimension, because I am one with Christ, I am with the Lord at the same time, seated with him in heaven. And that's where we need to walk supernaturally with the Lord. This is where this element of walking with the Lord is not just saying a little prayer and I hope everything goes well. No, no. Walking with the Lord is where he invites you to walk in a supernatural way with him, where he can show you even if need be heaven. Because if the Lord says, if you draw near to me, I will draw near to you now. Because God is a supernatural God, and the Lord Jesus lives in heaven, and the Holy Spirit is there too, but also inside of us, then the Lord can mix those two realities with us, that while you're living here on earth, you're learning to walk with the Lord, and then the blessings of walking with the Lord, uh, He can usher you, and He can show you things of heaven, just like He did with Enoch who walked with God. And even before he took him, he was having visions and dreams. He saw the second coming of Christ. So it depends on the way you're walking with the Lord, that the Lord can bless you and show you even more things, not only about earth, because we already seen earth, but about his purpose and heaven and the things that the Lord has for you. The only way you're going to accept, uh, you're going to be able to live this is by taking the word of God seriously and walking with him. You can argue as much as you want, like I did before. I can put myself in my theological framework, but nothing's going to happen unless you begin to walk with God. Then you will see the dimension that God can really take you, and then you will understand, Lord, you have so much for me. Not just to go to church and sing a few songs, and then try and, try and live life out during the week. But where the Lord says, I'm going to use you now powerfully. My power is going to flow through you. And then I'm going to give you visions and dreams. And then I'm going to show you more things about what you're reading in my word. And where the Lord can come to you and he can reveal himself to you. He can come into your room and reveal himself to you. Why not? He's God. We're the ones that are limiting him. But when he wants to reveal himself, he only does this to those who draw close to him. And that's why we have the examples in the Old Testament and the New Testament, where even Paul was going on, on the missionary journeys and the Lord had appeared to him three times to encourage him while he was going in these trips and while he was close to death. And these are things that are supernatural. Yet natural because you're learning to walk with the Lord. So it's not a good argument to tell the Lord, well, Lord, nobody has seen you, so that's never going to happen to me. I limit my walk with the Lord. I limit myself. I don't take the word seriously. I just play religiously. And yet the Lord has so much to show you, so much to do. And that's why I once I went to heaven the first time, I knew that I can talk to the Lord in such a way where I say, Lord, I'm reading your word. I'm here in the book of Revelation. I'm studying it. I've been in college. I looked at the Greek and the Hebrew. I've done all my homework. Now, would you please, Lord, show me more? There you go. There you go. And the Lord did. And the Lord did. And, uh, and that's what we're going to be talking about a little bit. Amen. Okay, so let's move over to the purpose of the tribulation. So briefly, I mentioned how you saw so much of the tribulation and how it's going to be bad. But what is the yeah. purpose for the tribulation? Well, look, there are many, there are quite a few purposes. You know, our world is divided in three groups at the moment. Uh, if, you, if you want to understand it first, there's the, 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 humanity but the gentiles the bible calls them the gentiles they're the non-jewish all the other nationalities that aren't jewish they're called gentiles yes in this world so that's 
uh, world of humanity, but they fall under the category Gentiles in the Bible. The second group is Israel, because God, uh, right from the start in Genesis 12 with Abraham, he made a pact with him, and he said that through him, a nation was going to be born, and, and that is Israel. And we see the story of Israel, or the people of God, from chapter 12 of the book of Genesis onwards, right up to the time of Christ, and right through the Bible, we see the people of God, who are the people, you know, the Israelites, and whom God had dealt with, and whom God came into a covenant relationship with them, and he made many promises to the people of Israel that have not yet been fulfilled, but will be fulfilled during the tribulation and during the coming of the Lord and during the millennium. So that group of the Jewish people, that little uh, uh, you know, nation called Israel, that's so little, so small, that nation has great purpose before the Lord. That's why when we look at the coming of Christ, we've got to look at the nation of Israel. What's happening in Israel? And the Lord has brought that nation back in 1948, back to as a nation, and the Lord has been working with it. And lots of prophecy has got to do with the people of Israel. The third group in the world is the church, the body of Christ, who are both Gentiles and Jewish, and the Lord has called people from all the world, from every nation around the world, to be part of the body of Christ. And that means those who, by faith, have received the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And where the Holy Spirit is dwelling within them, they are part of the body of Christ. And we are called the Church of the Lord, the Bride of Christ. And we are here together. Yes? So if you divide those three groups uh, up, Biblically, we're talking about, of course, yes, as the Bible puts it, then you're going to see that the tribulation is going to be, there's going to be a purpose for both the Gentiles. Now, the purpose for the Gentiles at the time of the tribulation is going to be for all the people that have rejected and are rejecting God Himself, have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, have rejected the love of God, and rejected the, the plan of God for their life. And uh, they're going to go through the tribulation. Let's say the tribulation starts in 10 years' time. And the population that's living in that time, after the church is taken away, first of all, right? There are millions upon millions of hundreds of millions that are going to leave this earth who are the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, who are believers in Christ. The Lord is coming for us. And then you can imagine the big void that there's going to be in, in the world of people that aren't going to be here because they're with the Lord in heaven. And all that other group that have stayed, they're the ones that are entering into that time of tribulation. And all those people are non-Christians. They can be religious people, even in churches, but have never received the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. These are the people, this is a group that's staying behind in our world that are non-Christians, again, that have rejected God, that have said no to salvation in Jesus, that have said, I'm going my own way, no thank you, and they're the ones that are going to be entering into that period of time. And the purpose for the Gentiles is going to be a purpose there of judgment. This time is going to be a judgment for the people who have blatantly rejected God, who said no to him. And, and that's a terrible thing to think about, but that is one of the purposes of the tribulation, is to bring judgment upon the world, a world of humanity that have rejected God and are going to continue rejecting him. And of course, there is going to be a great multitude of millions that are going to come to Christ, a great harvest that are going to come to Christ, even in the tribulation. But for the Gentiles, is a time of judgment. For Israel, that is going to be their presence, the Israelites, whether they be in the nation of Israel or anywhere around the world, in other nations, for that nation, there's going to be a time of purging. A time where the Lord is going to really deal with Israel, because remember, Israel rejected the Messiah 2,000 years ago. And they're still waiting for the Messiah. And that promise is still going to be given to them, but the Lord needs to purge and prepare Israel as a nation. And when he does this, they're also going to be under the purging of, of, of the Lord. And also the severe persecution is going to come upon them by the Antichrist. At the middle of the tribulation, 
that's in three and a half years after it begins, then the Antichrist will turn against Israel and will want to abolish that nation. There'll be great persecution towards her. And many are believing that they're going to be running. So many of them are going to go to the area of Petra and they're going to be hiding in caves that apparently they have been preparing these places in um, in caves, preparing foods and stock. They're preparing all that because they read prophecy. And that's going to be happening in the tribulation. So Israel will be severely persecuted by Satan himself through the Antichrist, through the false prophet. And this is going to be a time of purging for Israel. So when the Lord does come in the second coming and they see him coming, they'll see the one that they have pierced and they'll see him and they'll cry out to him and they'll run to the Lord and they'll see him. They'll realize he's the one that we killed 2000 years ago. He was the Messiah. So the Lord will need to prepare the hearts of Israel because the people of Israel are so stubborn. You know that. We preach to the Jews today and you get persecuted severely, rejected because they're believing on a Messiah that's just coming to rule without them really understanding that he had already come. But his own did not receive him. But the Lord has a plan for them in the tribulation. And that's uh, another purpose. You know, there's another purpose in the tribulation just to show Satan that he's not all sovereign. The Lord will clearly show Satan into the world that Satan has been a deceiver. He's the father of lies and that the Lord will once and for all show the world that they were deceived by this fallen angel and that in him there is no kingship nor rulership, but he is an usurper who has come to steal from Adam and Eve, yes, the right to rule upon this world, and that he will be severely judged in the lake of fire, him and all the demons, and then all the people that have rejected the Lord. So even in the time of tribulation where there's going to be great demonic activity, the Lord will severely show Satan and all his demons that they are, uh, that they are judged, and uh, the world will see this because the nations will see at the great white throne. The people will see themselves how the Lord will judge Satan and the nations will be in awe and in uh, great astonishment when they see this great dragon being judged by the Lord himself. And they will see that he was nothing but a phony, but someone who was trying to rule and um the father of lies. So that's another thing that because it's a, the satanic world will be very active in the tribulation more than ever, more than ever. That's why the first interview spoke about that, the demonic reality in our world. And that's why we as Christians have to walk with the authority of Christ because we have the victory in the Lord. And because we have that victory, the Lord is going to do something amazing. And uh, of course, there are many other things that the Lord is going to be showing through the tribulation. but And I want you to know, above all, this time of period of tribulation, it is God himself that will be judging. This is not a time where just Satan is going to be doing, creating more problems and more difficulties on the earth. This is the Lord himself is going to be doing this because this is characterizes Jacob's day of trouble, a time of the end. That explains Daniel. It is a great day of the wrath of God. So the tribulation is God bringing down judgment, correction, and purging on these groups and showing the world that this time is a time where God puts his foot down. He's ruling with an iron uh, rod of majesty to bring holiness and to cut away all the wickedness and the evilness that Satan has brought upon this world, and to show that King Jesus is a real ruler, sovereign God, who will bring peace to the world like never before. So this is not just a time where things get out of hand. No, this is a time where God himself is bringing judgment to the world, and he is the one that's doing all of this. Wow, John, that's a great, great ex explanation and an amazing summary. 
So let's get to how did you get to see the tribulation? Because I know you were able to see it twice from two different vantage points. So yes. let's talk about the first time. How did the first time, how did you, or how were you able to even see? What did you do? What were you doing? How did it come about? Well, you know, I was, again, I was being led to read through and study the book of uh, Revelation. And I got to the chapter six, verse 14, where it says in the latter part that every mountain and every island was being removed from its place. And I knew what that meant, of course. This is not just a 7.6 on the rector scale. This is cataclysmic, what's happening there. It is so cataclysmic that in order for, a, for an island to be removed from its place and to sink under the ocean, this is cataclysmic. And when I saw that, and I kept on reading and reading and reading, I began to say to the Lord, Lord, I've been studying this, all this, Lord, Again, can you show me what this means? Can you put me in that place? And that's what he did. I only prayed this for a few days. And then, lo and behold, the Lord took me from my body. And he took me to that future time. And he placed me on the ocean. I was hanging on to a huge log. And, uh, and lo and behold, I'm looking forward. And I see I'm about at least 10 to 20 kilometers away from this island. And it was a very big island. And what happened was that as I was seeing this island, I was seeing that it was it began to the the, the ocean began to to move. In other words, the currents of water were just moving in a massive way, and I could hear the rumble at the very island, the rumble uh, just moving in such a way. And you know, when it starts to rumble, all the dust begins to go up into the air. And uh, I could hear the screaming of people. And all of a sudden, I see to my right-hand side, I see how it must have been the te tectonic plates must have gone down on one side because in order for an island to sink, there's got to be room for it to go down. The tectonic uh, plate went down. And then all of a sudden, I see like a waterfall on my right-hand side. This is in the ocean. I see the ocean, the level of the ocean be split in half and all of a sudden it begins to fall to one side and at least 100 meters, a waterfall going down. And, you know, I love flying, but I don't like heights. And when I'm seeing this and I'm hanging on to the, the log, I'm seeing that I'm right at the edge and I'm seeing multitudes of souls of people that already the ocean have been dragging away from the island coming through and they're all going down into this massive waterfall because of the tectonic plate that's been moved. And then again, it has to fill up again, right? Because it's got to level up again. But I'm seeing all of this, and I'm looking down, and the Lord is allowing me to see how this island is sinking, 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 and not a matter of hours or a matter of days, a matter of minutes, Minutes, literally, just going down, 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 down. And then I see the whole ocean just shifting and moving and the waterfall, and I'm right there, and I see people in absolute desperation. Death was just passing by me, and I was seeing what Revelation chapter 6, verse 14 was all about. You just read it here very quickly, you know. You see it and say, oh, okay, that's terrible, and you just keep on reading but what happens there when you see the real thing? It's like seeing uh, Mount Helens, you know, it was recorded and you see that devastation. When you see the devastation, you see that it's so mammoth and so big. If that was big, that was just like a little, I don't know, uh, it, it's it's no significance at all in comparison to see a whole island go under and what that causes in the ocean and the millions of tons of liters of, of water i don't know what dimension i can put it but it was so huge and the lord was just keeping me there safe but in order for me to see exactly what was happening and how it's going to be in that moment where islands are going to be sinking and this is going to be caused because of a great earthquake that's going to be devastating and how the earth is going to be shaken now, the last earthquake we had, I think it was in 2010, the, the earthquake in Chile, and then the tsunami, 
it moved a degree a few degrees the earth from its axis this kind of cataclysmic movement is going to shift the earth in a greater way that's why the devastation is coming to the earth and the things that are going to be happening imagine that's why lady says that even the ships that are on in the oceans that are just traveling remember they're navigating through the oceans many of them are going to be uh, are going to sink because of tidal waves uh, and because of the movement of everything on the ocean and the the very earth uh these these are cataclysmic movements that are so huge and that's just one do you know where in the world you were when god put you at this location I, in the ocean? I, look i wasn't told where i was it, for me uh, I wasn't told where I was, uh, but he did. The Lord did show me that uh, there was a massive island. This was massive, but I could see, but not all the scope of the island. Like, like I said, twenty kilometers away, but I could see part of the island. But the whole island was so much bigger, and the whole the the whole island just began to sink and sink and sink. But it wasn't just sinking; it was a population of people that were dying, because after that there was nothing else around. It was this ocean. And because of the shifting of that, it began to move in such a rapid way. And the Lord allowed me to see that just so I can understand this is this is real. It's part of the the you know, the earth groans. We're told by the word of God, it groans even for the coming of the Lord, and because of the effects of sin upon the earth, it groans. The earth should have been like Eden from the very beginning. And the Lord, when he comes, he will reestablish the earth in such a way where it, where it will look like Eden again. Praise the Lord. Amen. You know? so that's not going to be heaven, but it will be restored again for us to live here for a thousand years. And then we're having the new earth and, and new heaven. But um, praise the Lord, he's going to do that. But part of that judgment upon the, the, the Gentiles, the, the nations, is going to be that. Part of it is just seeing the devastation now, that's why people will know this is not just coming from a bomb or this or that. This is coming from heaven itself, this judgment, and they will realize that. And these are people that lamentably have rejected God. And uh, and the Lord has had 2,000 years, you know, of, of love and mercy. And for every generation, the Lord has shown love and mercy. Every generation, not one person can say, God did not show love and mercy in our generation. Or I never heard about God. The Lord has always revealed himself to every nation by sending missionaries and pastors and now social media and the preaching of the word and people receiving these things. Uh, but that's going to be just one of so many other things that the world is going to suffer. And the Lord put me there. So what I was seeing was the reality of this little part here coming alive and uh if we saw the tsunami on on tv and we were able to see it time and time and time again and the tidal waves and all those things and and the hundreds of thousands of people that died and we've seen that on tv imagine something like this where we will have social media to a larger degree where people will be able to see from every angle of the of the earth and uh and that will be revealed to them and they will see this and the devastation, and that's why when I saw that and when I prayed that, uh, you know, the Lord gave me this same vision twice, one night, and then the next night he showed me the same thing. And then I said, okay, Lord, I got the message. <laughs> I saw it. I, I, I was terrified. I, I wept much, but the Lord was saying, this is so you know, this is mm -hmm. you've seen it with your eyes, and this is what's going to be happening. It's not just the island. It's the people. Mm -hmm the people god loves the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life our prayer is that people would come to the lord jesus because he loves you so much he doesn't want man he doesn't desire the death of man god uh he doesn't want any to perish he wants people to come to him and to receive eternal life but when we come to the book of revelation we see another reality that is there that we cannot deny that is right there. And this is part of the judgments at the beginning. This is at the beginning of the tribulation. And, We're that, not was talking about and that was Revelation 6, right? Revelation 6. This mm -hmm. is just the beginning. Mm -hmm. The first year 
the first year of the tribulation. Imagine we've got seven years and we've got seven seals, seven trumpets and seven cups that all go in a chronological way and with greater severity of judgments from the Lord. And yet the Lord is purging Israel. The Lord is showing the world that he's real and yet he's showing mercy to them so they can come to him. But many, many, many will not. And we were talking about that just a few minutes ago. Wow, that's devastating. So what did you see after that? So you were not, I mean, I just, this, I'm glad you, you mentioned that because that's an, that's a vantage point that I've never heard anyone say before. I've heard testimonies, a few testimonies of people who've seen the tribulation, but I've never heard anyone describe how the mountains and the islands and the land will disappear the way yeah. that you just did. So what happened after that? What did you see? After that, I, I, I saw it and I woke up and I woke up and I was in tears. I said, Lord, this is so devastating. And the Lord was just telling me and reminding me that this period of time, it's not something that you and I can pray about and it won't happen. Mm. We cannot pray for the tribulation not to happen. That's already been decreed by the Lord. Yeah. This is something that is unchangeable. It's part of his plan. And uh, But we can, what we can do is prepare ourselves. We won't be in it, but we can prepare ourselves by the greatest thing that we can do is reaching people for Christ. This is the number one priority. The number one priority is to first as a family, for those of us who are listening to us, to reach your children for Christ, your spouse, your loved ones, uh, your parents, your cousins. Reach them for the Lord. And this is what the Lord wants. And that's why the Lord places so much emphasis, not only in this period of time of the devastation, but on people, because souls are eternal. And the, and the great thing for us to understand is that uh, even in these situations here, like we couldn't change what happened in the tsunami, right? But what happens before these things happen? It's what's crucial. Before this period of time is coming, what's crucial for the church of the Lord to be awakened, to be preaching the gospel, to share the gospel with people everywhere. Because the more we share, the more we, we, we explain to people that there is salvation in Jesus Christ, more and more people are going to come to him. More and more people are going to give their lives to the Lord. And that's why the sense of urgency in my life, in our life, we need to be ablaze for the Lord. We need to be full on passion for the Lord. And we need to be able to be ready to, to, to share and to speak about these truths to our children and to our, you know, in our homes and in our churches. We need to be preaching about the book of Revelation. So not only are we prepared, but we must go out and share the gospel with people. This is the urgency. The Lord, he just didn't put, the Lord didn't put all these things here. You know, people get, love the curiosity. What's going to happen in the future? And we just stay in that curiosity. The book of Revelation wasn't written for our curiosity. It was written so we may hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. And we may be awakened and we may preach the word of God and share the word of God. We don't want people to suffer through this period of time. But what we can do is from our part and say, Lord, I'm going to I'm gonna be a vessel in your hands. I'm going to be preaching the gospel. But this period of time will happen. There's no escaping it. There's no changing it. The, the devil can't change it. He knows it's coming. That's why he's so desperate more than ever to try and deceive mankind wow. and to take him to a place where don't worry about this. Everything's fine. Everything's cool and everything's good. That's not going to happen. That's what the devil is saying. Yet the word of God tells us that there is this time that's going to be coming. And uh, it's going to be very, very soon. I believe that too. And I know you mentioned to me earlier that you saw what's going to happen to the population of the earth. Oh, yes. Well, the Bible tells us that one fourth of the earth, if we're reading the word of God, one fourth of the earth will uh, not only be shaken, but will die in this period of time of the seven years. That's a fourth of the population. And, and now we're, we're, we're going to take away those who are in Christ and the rapture comes. Millions upon millions and millions and millions are going to be taken away 
from the earth. So whatever's left behind, a fourth of that population, and then later a third is going to be wiped out in judgment. So even if you have 5 million left, 5 billion left, sorry, on earth after the church is taken, an example, right? Or 4 billion left on earth, a fourth of that will be gone in judgment and will die during this period of time of seven years. So that is a massive number of people that are going to be, uh, that are going to die in judgment. Well, John, there are some people who are wondering right now, why does God have to judge the planet? Why does he have to do it like this? Well, it's, uh, again, it's a great question. And the problem is that the world is duped in sin. The problem of our world is sin. And sin has brought the devastation to our world. Already starting from Adam and Eve and how they disobeyed God and they were deceived by Satan. Satan has brought through that temptation great calamity to the world because of sin. Sin has separated man from God and he died spiritually, not physically at first, physically later, years later. But that relationship that he had with God, that was severed. And yet from the beginning, God had an answer for salvation. But everything that's happened in our world is because of sin. Sin has, br has brought brokenness to our world, has brought a curse to our world. And God does not close his eyes before sin. He needs to judge it. Now, he judged sin at the cross of Calvary. And Jesus took our sins upon, upon him. But yet, at the same time, this world is still suffering from the sinfulness of sin. Yes? And because sin still reigns in the hearts of people, those who reject God, then it comes to a point where the Lord has to judge people who reject God. He needs to step in because he is a ruler. And in his presence, there is no sin. There's only holiness. So God has to step in and to stop Satan, stop sin, and judge this. Because remember, God judged uh, uh, sin by sending his son, the most precious thing that he did. He did it through his son, and man can have salvation in Jesus Christ. But when man persists in his sin by rejecting God, then the natural outcry of the holiness of God, because God is holy, God cannot accept rebellion and sin before his very presence. He must judge it, because that is out of his character. That's his character. And because he's holy, then out of his holiness... He brings judgment and righteousness mm -hmm. and to show mankind that you cannot rule by your sin, this world. You've done it, and we've seen the results of that. Every nation, every government, every decade, and every throughout history, we've seen the results of the sinfulness of man trying to rule mankind and what that has caused. has caused devastation. has caused chaos. So God at this time is bringing judgment and purging, and then when Christ comes, he will show the true rulership of righteousness and holiness upon the world that is so different to what we have been living today. So God is acting out of his holiness, out of his character, to obliterate sin, to stop all this nonsense that Satan brought upon the world. And then we will see the rulership of Christ, and then we will be taken to heaven how it should have been from the very beginning. Yes, a glorious, glorious a rulership, a theocracy, that means God ruling over us in holiness and justice and peace and glory. Great answer. Great answer. And it's God's righteous judgment is right. It's fair. And uh, everything yeah. that and you when we think about everything that we've suffered and our loved ones suffered and and everything that happened, even to the Jews, you know, in the Holocaust I mean, all throughout the years, people have been crying God, when are you going to vindicate us? When are you going to judge right. them? And that's it's only right. fair that God judges all the evil that's been done because it's fair. It's right. So thank you. I mean, what you explained was so great. So John, take us to the second time that you saw the tribulation and you saw even more this time. You saw people and the stars and what wasn't the stars and all that. Share with us. Yes, it was. It was just amazing. Again, I was in the book of uh, Revelation, and there I saw, um, you know, the, how meteorites are going to be falling upon the earth and how that's going to also devastate 
uh, the earth, it's going to happen because the rivers are going to be yeah, poisoned and the oceans too. You know, when a meteor uh, or a shower of meteorites does fall, the, the devastation that that causes is uh, uh, it's poisonous. It's um, You can't drink of that. And, and this is what's going to be happening in the tribulation. One of the judgments too that are going to be physical and it's going to be happening in the tribulation. And I was reading that in the word of God. And as I was reading it, I also realized that the stars in the Bible are not just mentioned as physical stars. We're not talking about the, the stellar stars that are so many light years away. We're talking about uh, meteorites, but also the Bible speaks about stars that uh, the stars present themselves before the presence of the Lord and even uh, Satan presented himself. Remember the book of Job in chapter one and chapter two. And uh, one of the names for the angels is stars. And there's a fallen stars also, which are demons. And, um, and as we see that, I began to understand. And then I began to read more. And I went back to Job and then back to Revelation. And then I began to ask the Lord, Lord, can you reveal this to me and show me how this is going to be happening? After reading the book of Revelation in this aspect, the Lord took me out of my body one night. And he placed me in a city. Again, he didn't show me the name of the city, but he placed me in a city. But he wasn't here. He wasn't here in the Gold Coast. He was somewhere else because of the buildings and the things that I was seeing. And what happened was this. I looked up in the sky. And there were many people around me. And again, whenever the Lord places me in a place, I can feel, I can see, I can touch. All my senses are awakened. I'm in my spirit. My body's still sleeping, but I'm in there in that scene. But people cannot see me. But I can see them. But all of a sudden, I was amongst a crowd of people, and we saw her up in the sky, and it was this meteor was coming down. And I was thinking, okay, it's coming, and it's going to go by the earth and continue. But this one was coming down, and all of a sudden, it turned around, and it came down. And as it was coming down, we were looking at it, and the trajectory of it was it must have fallen at least a kilometer away from where we were, down the middle of the city. And it, when, when it hit, I mean, the uh, the sound of it was tremendous, but it wasn't like a, an atomic bomb because it, that could easily happen, right, with a meteorite. With a meteorite, and even in Saudi Arabia, I was looking at a documentary where they believe a meteorite hit that area and it exploded uh, um, some 200 meters before the earth and it created a devastating, for kilometers and kilometers, it de a devastated effect upon the forest. It just burned everything out. And uh, But it wasn't like that with this one. It hit the ground. We could see the plume, yes, rising up, but nothing else was shattered. But it turned into a whirlwind of fire. It was a tornado of fire. And all of a sudden, what I started seeing was this massive tornado, like a five uh, grade five, or what do you call them in America? The, the worst of the worst. It was massive, and it was just all of fire. And I'm saying, what is this? I thought it was just a meteor, but it turned into this whirlwind of fire. It was so massive, and it started destroying people and burning them up before my very eyes. And as it started moving, it began to move very quickly through the city and coming closer and closer to where I was so I could see the devastation. And I was hearing from a father cries. You know how you hear the cries of people that are running everywhere, but the cries of terror. And then all of a sudden, as it's coming closer and closer, then I can see people running everywhere and they're being consumed by this fire right in front of me. I can see them being consumed. It, it engulfs them, and they light up like a torch straight away, and they're absolutely engulfed by this. And I'm trying to do something, but I can't. I'm just watching. And as it gets to – there's a train station right there. I could see the people in the platform and the train, and they were running into the train. It was jam-packed. And they said, we're going to save ourselves. And the train started moving forward, accelerating. And all of a sudden, this ball of fire comes and goes into the back carriage and goes right through the carriage. 
and burns everybody alive. And I was absolutely shocked, absolutely shocked. And everyone that I had seen, that my eyes could see, everybody was dead, just completely all of them had died, just dropped dead. And then there was this man who was trying to get away. He was probably one of the last persons in that area where I was. And I was telling him, come with me and you will be saved. Come with me. But he couldn't see me. And as I looked at him, his eyes were coming out of his sockets of terror, knowing that he would die at any second now. So we were at the edge between this building and we were, he was facing me, I was facing him, but he couldn't see me. He was trying to see which way he would run. And I said, come with me and you will be saved. And he just turned around. He ran the other way to the corner of the building. As soon as he stepped out of the building, the fire came and consumed him. Total, con It was horrible. And then I was thinking, what is causing this? I know it's a, like a tornado, but it must be something else. And then I look to my right-hand side. I go to the corner of the building, and then I follow it along. And then there's an open space, like a huge, huge open space, like a park, open space. I was at the edge of the city in this open, open space. And all of a sudden, I'm going, I'm walking quickly to the end of this uh, building to see what is it that has been causing this. And all of a sudden, Jennifer, I see a four-story principality, a demon, walking away from this section of the city, walking away with great defiance. And this demon was walking. It was like a seen a big, huge not a King Kong, but like a blob, black, deformed. I looked at his head, the back section of his head. It was just massive, but he had these ears like a bat. And then I'm looking at it, and it's about 50 meters away from me. And then the anger of the Lord by the Spirit of God comes upon me because I saw the devastation that this demon had just created, killing Thousands of people just in front of me, killing thousands. And there was great defiance in this demon walking away with great pride. You could sense the pride that it had, this devilish pride that it had because it, it accomplished its mission by killing the souls of people. There was nothing left, no one left, just smoke, smell of rotten flesh that's been burned up in the in the atmosphere and I was alone now and the Lord allowed me to see this clearly and I saw this a four story a giant uh, principality this demon and I step out of that into the open space and then he realizes someone else is left this is the impression that I got straight away that by the way he turned around he was saying there's someone left that I didn't kill and, and, and like I said, it's four story high, like a blob, very big, very defiant. It turned around and it looked at me. And when I saw his face, it was partly a face of a bat uh, with, with, with the cheeks of a bulldog. If we can mix this up a little bit. It was partly animal, bestial, right? And part hat but a feral, vicious cat. It was a mixture of all this. It was hideous. A deformed, and this used to be an angel before, uh, deformed and very powerful, very powerful. You could tell that it, it had great power because principalities have power over regions. Uh, and they, the principalities, have other demons under them that they uh, tell them what to do. Right, and those under him have uh, power over other demons that are uh, demons that are minions that do the little work, the, the the things that hassle people and all that. But this was very strong. But as soon as this demon saw me, it 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 sort of growled, but I began to run towards it. <laughs> 
but I'm running in the power of the Lord and in the wrath of the Lord, right? Because I've, I've just seen something that I was so horrific. And now that I knew it was a demon, a principality, I said, I'm running towards it. But it wasn't just my instinct. It was the spirit of the Lord that took me to run towards him. And as I'm running, I can see myself like this, right? And then I raised my hand. I pointed at him. And I said, in the name of Jesus, as soon as I said this, Jennifer and dear hearers, as soon as I said this, his ears that were like bat, they came down like a shishai cat. He was so scared. He was petrified just by the name of Jesus. He was absolutely petrified. And all the defiance and all the... The pride that it had, it just melted away. And then he turned around and he began to run away from me. And I said, in the name of Jesus, you go back to the abyss. I shouted at it. And all of a sudden, he just ran a bit. He jumped up into the air. And then he went head first into the ground and down the abyss. Wow. When this happened. So much power in the name of Jesus. Wow. I saw the mighty power of the Lord once again. And I rejoice so much because of that power. But I cried so much too because of the souls that it had destroyed. Thousands of people. Thousands, Jennifer. And just, it came with such fury. And you know the Bible says when Satan is going to be thrown out of the second heaven. And he's going to be thrown onto the earth. He comes with great fury, the Bible says. Great fury. And he goes and he, uh, he comes to the dragon, comes to persecute in chapter 12 of the book of Revelations. He comes with great fury and he comes to persecute. Imagine, he comes to persecute uh, the woman, which is a picture of Israel, God's people, he came to persecute her to the point that he wants to obliterate the people of Israel. He can't, he won't, but he will, he will persecute her in such a way that that's where she will be protected by the Lord and they would have to escape into caves where they will be protected by the Lord. And the persecution will begin from there, from Satan and the beast, which is another name for the Antichrist and the false prophet. So what I want to say in this second vision that is very clear, that not only are asteroids and, 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 and meteorites are going to be falling upon the earth, the Lord was showing me that these stars that are also falling are falling because the, the Lord has... Um, taken many of these principalities even from the second heaven and they're coming down to earth and it'll be hell on earth for that last three and a half years of the tribulation uh, because this is where the antichrist establishes himself as god upon this world his true colors are going to come up because he's a false leader who brings a false peace for the first three and a half years where he makes a covenant with Israel at the beginning, right? Some people say we're in the tribulation now. We're not in the tribulation yet. You know why? Because Antichrist would be doing right now. Uh, we know him as Antichrist. He won't be known as Antichrist here on earth. He's going to have another name as a leader that's going to bring a great solution to our world. And he will do a, uh, a pact to bring a solution with Israel, because you know that uh, in the Middle East, all these countries that have wanted to obliterate Israel, right from the word when they become a nation, and, and e Egypt and, and all these nations, Turkey and Iran, Iraq, all these nations that have been wanting to obliterate Israel, only the Antichrist will be able to do a treaty with them at the beginning of the tribulation, and, that's, and the church has already been taken. Then they do a treaty, uh, with Israel, and Israel will receive peace from the Western world, but also from the Middle East, that they will have the freedom and 
the false peace of saying you can do what you want. You can build your uh, temple now. You can sacrifice it. You used to do it in the Old Testament. There will be a false peace that Israel will fall under that deception. And at the middle of the tribulation is where uh, Satan is being thrown from. No more access to heaven or the third heaven or the second heaven is thrown down to earth. He furiously is thrown down to earth. He possesses completely the Antichrist. And from then on, the Antichrist says, now I am God. He will get rid of the false religions of the world. He will establish himself as the only God to be worshipped in this world. And those who do not worship him and who do not have the mark of the beast, because people that are going to worship him and follow the Antichrist, they will have the mark of the beast. And the, the mark of the beast was not the um, the vaccine. You know, <laughs> many people thought that's the mark of the No, that's not the mark of the beast. But it will be like the word of God says, that mark will be in the front of the head of people or on their hands. And that'll be uh, something that we know it's being developed, right? Even some country, they're putting a chip already, but it doesn't mean it's going to be the chip, but there could be just a progression of something that later on is going to be so advanced uh, that uh, people will receive this. Now, that will be an, that will be an obligation of do or die because the antichrist will say right you got to worship me so you got to take the mark my mark and that means that you have allegiance with me and those who do not have that mark will be killed will be persecuted and will be martyred so it's not a matter of you know if you like it you don't like it if you don't have the mark they will persecute you and if they grab you you will be martyred and many will be beheaded in that period of time it's a terrible time but that's where the antichrist will take absolute control with uh, satan and with the false prophets and uh and this is the last period of the tribulation and that's where the the two witnesses will be killed because they were there from the beginning of the tribulation to the middle of the tribulation they'll be killed and in the middle of the tribulation the Lord will resurrect them in the eyes in front of the eyes of the whole world. Can you believe this? That the heart of man, the sinfulness of man is so strong and so wicked that when they kill these prophets, the Bible says that they will leave their bodies there for three days and they'll be giving themselves gifts as if it's Christmas. <laughs> giving themselves gifts like saying, we are blessed now that we're not being confronted by these two witnesses that have brought such uh, judgment upon us because they'll have the power to bring judgment and even death upon those who want to attack them. But they'll be there as witnesses before the Lord for the whole world to see. I mean, the cameras are going to be there and social media is going to be there. The whole world will see these two witnesses. Now, that's why everything that the Lord is planning will be global. This tribulation is global. It's not just in one section. It will affect the whole world. And the second part of, 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 of the tribulation, what I'm saying is that the demonic activity will heighten like never before. Even I was telling you, Jennifer, that and, and dear hearers, that, you know, there's a point in the tribulation where there's going to be like scorpion-like demons that are coming to try and, and hunt down those who have the mark of the beast. And there are others that are not going to have the mark of the beast because they're going to be coming to Christ in that period of time. And all those who have the mark of the beast, these demons are going to come to attack them, to sting them. And that sting will be the, like, the sting of a scorpion, which I've, I've heard it is excruciating. And they'll be one to, they really are going to be seeking to die, but death will escape them. What's the movie that you said that it's like? Death Takes a Holiday. You guys, if you haven't seen it, it came out in 1934 and is when death takes a holiday for about three days when the Bible mentions people could not die for, is it six months, yeah. John? Six months, something like that. It made five me think of this movie. Yeah. So for five months, I will be seeking death and they won't be able to die. But the pain and the torment will be there. This is all part of judgment. And even and even the the demons are going to be allowed to do this to to mankind, 
and uh, and then later 200 million, 200 million. I mean, there's only uh, 25 million in Australia. Imagine 200 million. That's two thirds of America. You have 300 million plus in America. Imagine yeah, I two. Know, I don't know how many we have here. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you have probably 350 million uh, of people that are living there. And uh, about three, uh, 200 million demons are coming out of the abyss, uh, led out by four uh, powerful demons that are uh, right now, right now, they are at the Euphrates River. You can't see them, but they're there. They're waiting for that specific time and moment, the Bible says, that they will go and open those doors of the abyss. It's interesting because people that have gone to hell have said that there are portals and there are doors that they went through, yes? Uh, they went through to get into hell. Well, there, there, there are portals in there and there are doors that are locked specifically for these 200 million uh, demons that have been placed for that time, for that season, also to come and to... Um, attack mankind for those who have the mark of the beast not for those who are sealed with the seal of god because the lord is going to protect them and that's a beautiful thing about it the 144,000 are going to be protected by the lord they're going to have the seal of the lord and they're going to be preaching the gospel then later they're going to be martyred yes they will be martyred there are groups in, in when you begin to read the book of revelations there are groups of believers that are in the martyrs group, that they will give their lives for the Lord willingly, like Stephen. And like, I think it was, I don't know if it was Moody, D.L. Moody, or, or one great preacher who said, blessed are the martyrs, for they will be close to the throne of God. Wow. And that is so beautiful. And you see that even in chapter 7, those who, had, who have been dying, in the tribulation because they were martyred and they cry out to the Lord, how long, O oh Lord, how long will you take vengeance upon our blood? And the Lord said, just wait a little bit more for there are more of your brothers that need to be martyred and then to come to heaven. Yes, there are martyrs, just like today there are martyrs, that you and I will live in our uh, you know, first world and, 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 and we live happily and we move and we work and we... You know, we don't know about these things, but there are people that are dying as martyrs today. And blessed are they, for they will shine like stars before the presence of the Lord. So this time of tribulation will also be a time where many of the Christians will give their lives to the Lord and through their testimony they will die. And on the other side, there will be many also who won't die as martyrs, but they will live throughout the tribulation and yet they will enter into the millennium as believers to reign with Christ. Because in the millennium, there'll be people that are obviously those who enter into the millennium here on earth when Christ returns. They will be believers in Christ, Christians. All the rest have died and only Christians are entering into the millennium. And, and they will continue living and, and getting married and having children, yes, and uh, in the time of the of the millennium. And that's another topic I know. It's so exciting when you begin to read and how they will live up to a thousand years, like in the Old Testament, remember, with Adam and all that group. And uh, uh, it's going to be fascinating. But we're talking about the, the believers in the... Uh, the tribulation. Some people have said this, Jennifer, how can there be believers in the tribulation if the church has been taken away? Well, I tell them the Holy Spirit is still working in the tribulation with salvation. And you got the 144,000 that will be there from the beginning that the Lord has chosen. And there'll be emissaries and preachers that will go around the world preaching the word of God. You're going to have an angel that's going to be preaching the gospel around the earth, flying around the earth continuously. It's like having a satellite going round and round. <laughs> and you can say the angel is coming. Let's see what he's saying. And uh, and I'm sure there's going to be literature. Even if you post now something on 
on YouTube. Imagine I'm telling this to my son. He's saying, but we've got to tell him, Dad. He was telling me today, we've got to tell him about Jesus. And I said, we will. We're going to do a YouTube video and we're going to be sharing the gospel because who knows, maybe in the tribulation, someone's going to see the video okay. or they're going to see the deep believer, right? And they're going to say, look, they believed in Jesus. They're not here with us. But how did they come? And they will hear of those stories and they will bow down before the Lord Jesus and give their life to the Lord. Isn't that awesome that all of this is going to be possible? The Holy Spirit will still be here working in the souls of men and women as they come to Christ because that will happen. There's going to be a massive, massive harvest in the tribulation. And many of those are going to be martyred. And they're in chapter 7 of the book of Revelation. But in the Bible says, they're from all nations and all peoples. These are not just Jewish. These are people from all the world, even in that time, will come to know the Lord and will give their lives to the Lord. And they will pay their life because they know Jesus, just like the, the disciples say, he's died as martyrs. But they gave their life for the Lord. So this time, there's going to be great salvation, and and uh, and and the Lord is going to bring that great joy to the world. Because in the worst of times, the Lord's mercy and grace is going to be awesome. It's going to shine. And I have a question for you. Actually, two questions for you. When you saw both of these visions, did you hear anyone crying out to God? when they were being burnt alive or when no, the island no, no, was no. sinking? No, sadly not, uh, Jennifer, because they had already established in their heart, just like we do when the gospel is preached to us and we open our hearts to the Lord and we say yes to Jesus and we invite him into our hearts. Uh, so it happens with people who reject God. Of course, the Lord gives them opportunity until the very time, even to the time of absolute death, there are people that have on the brink of death and the Lord still shows his mercy. Yes. Even John Ramirez. I know uh, you probably heard of him and John Ramirez was He's saying. He's actually going to be on in a few weeks. Oh, excellent. Ooh. excellent. <laughs> yeah. I love John Ramirez. And and he's going to, he, he said the Lord saved him from hell itself. So imagine, but none of the people that I saw of the multitudes None of them bowed down before the Lord. None of them cried out to the Lord. And, and you know what? The Lord would save them if they would just bow down to him. The Lord would preserve them. And the most astonishing thing when I come to the second coming of Christ in chapter 19, that both you and I, we, we, we were like saying, how could this be? In chapter 19, when the Lord is returning, you know, he's returning to earth will be it will be like a lightning you know how the sky is lit up now it's going to be a, a procession of the glory of god approaching the earth it's not just going to be like that's it and here we are no 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 this is going to be the glory of god is going to be nearing the earth and those who are watching are going to know that this is not you know a natural thing this is glory they'll be able to see that this is the coming of the king. And when the Lord comes at that very moment, it's the worst of worst moment because this is where Armageddon is happening. Now, uh, the battle of Armageddon is in uh, in the fields of uh, in the land of uh, Israel. And it's a stretch of about 300 plus kilometers of a stretch of land that they're going to be soldiers there fighting. And the Bible says that uh, the nations will be fighting and fighting also against Israel and other nations. And uh, the antichrists and the false prophet will be there in that battle. And as soon as I begin to see the coming of the Lord in verse 11 onwards, they will see that the faithful and true who's coming is coming to for battle. And because the Lord knows what's happening down there, right? As he's approaching now earth, it's like, you know, the shadow coming down. You're approaching, you're seeing, and you're getting close there to still maybe 200 kilometers away from touching down. And you're seeing the whole thing. And then as you're approaching, the Lord approaching on a white horse and all the saints with him in glory coming down. 
the Bible says that the kings of the earth and the beast, in verse 19, they gathered to war with the one who was on the white horse mm -hmm. and his army. Now, I'm translating it from Spanish to English here because I've got my Spanish <laughs> the Bible. And, they're, they're, you know, instead of, can you imagine the glory of the Lord is coming? They see the Lord in the white horse in his holiness and glory and all of his, you know, all of the saints in white horses that are coming and angels. You would think at that moment they would have dropped everything, dropped to their knees and would ask the Lord to forgive them and they would repent. But the Bible says they didn't. that they didn't. Mm -hmm. And uh, not only they didn't, they wanted to make warfare with the Lord. Can you imagine that? How can that shows you the sinfulness of sin in the heart of man? That's how wicked sin is. Mm -hmm. That's what Jesus died for. The wickedness of sin in our heart that was created by the temptation of Lucifer at the Garden of Eden, and that's how wicked sin is, to the point where they see the Lord and His holiness and in His power, and yet they wanted to make war with Him, and then the Lord with one strike, it just comes down. He wipes all that army away, which some believe would be easily one to two million soldiers that are in that stretch, and once He wipes that out just with the word of His mouth, by the declaration of His mouth, the blood that's going to be running from that uh, battlefield all the way through Jerusalem, the Kindron Valley, all of that, and the blood is up to the reign of the horses, the heights. It's about a meter 40. A meter 40 of a river of blood rushing down uh, to, through the Kindron Valley and then flowing through. That's the manifestation of the wickedness of man. And sometimes we say, but could the Lord be more merciful? Oh, my goodness. The Lord is so merciful, so glorious. And yet the question is not can the Lord be more merciful. He's already been all merciful. Can wickedness, the question is how can wickedness be so wicked and so horrific that it takes these soldiers to point their guns and machinery, their artillery, yes, their weapons in that time, to try and kill the Lord Jesus. I it, It's just, I was talking to people here that just, they said, Pastor John, that is so, so wicked. And some are in tears because they can't believe the wickedness of man at the very end. But that's what's going to happen. Not only then, but even at the end of the millennium, when Satan is loose, he's going to get people from the nations and they're going to want to come against the Lord. And oh my goodness. I praise the Lord that he, he's going to come to wipe out sin once and for all. You see, it has to be wiped away. It has to be utterly destroyed, sin. And that sin is attached to wicked men. That's why the Lord has established that uh, the punishment, because sin has to be not only obliterated, but it will be punished forever Amen. and into the lake of fire. We won't have memory of that because the Lord is going to take all the memory from all of that wickedness and and uh, and sorrow and all of those things. We won't be thinking about those things when we're in heaven. But uh, but to tell us that the Lord shows us that uh, that's how wicked sin is. And imagine that sin is also in the angels that have fallen, that are demons, that that will not change their character and that will be manifested Throughout the tribulation, demons causing all sorts of havoc, you know. And that's why we see that this period of time is a period of righteous judgment from the Lord. And he needs to judge sin and judge wicked men that have chosen willfully by their own hearts and their own desires to follow, you know, their own destiny and to follow in this time the Antichrist who's a personification of the devil who rules inside of him and uh, and uh, and reigns in him. And then their end will be everlasting time in the lake of fire. So when when I look at, at, at the book of, of Revelation and I look at all these truths, the Lord again wrote this book through the hand of our dear brother, Apostle John. 
by the Holy Spirit because the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit. He's the author of the Word of God, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has written all of these for us in the book of Revelations so we may be encouraged as Christians, so we may focus on what is priority, so we may understand that the end is coming, that suffering and that all that has caused sin, that sin is caused in our world, all of that will be done away with very soon. And that our priority, our heart's beat should be, I want to serve the Lord. I want to love the Lord. More than ever, I want to be there serving the Lord in my home church and in the mission field and at work. More than ever, we should be united as brothers in Christ. We should be stronger in our faith. We should rejoice to know that the Lord is coming and that no wickedness, no devil, no demon, nothing in this world will rule over and take over the, the, the kingship of our Lord because greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. And that we have now the opportunity not only to prepare ourselves Jennifer, in this period of time, but to encourage one another to be strong in our faith, committed to the Lord, to be committed to our churches, to pray for our pastors, pray for our missionaries, and pray so we who know that the Lord is calling, like I said last time in the first interview, if the Lord is calling you and has been calling you, don't run away from that. Run towards your calling. And fulfill that calling of the Lord, because there are many that are waiting for you. There are many who are who need the Lord Jesus Christ. And this period of time that we're living right now, we're at the footsteps of the beginning of that period of time of the tribulation. We as a church will be taken up to be with the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. But that should motivate us more than ever to live for the Lord, to be excited about being at church on Sunday and during the week and see how we can uh, serve others, see how we can use our spiritual gifts. So, John, when you saw the tribulation in both your visions, yes. how did the surroundings look? Did the surroundings look like the era we're in now? Did you did the houses look the same? Were, was the dress the same? Did it look like? Yes, yes. it didn't look right like. Now? It didn't look like something like 100 years from now. None of that. It looked very current. The buildings, trains, everything around us, very much like it is today. I believe, I believe that we are the last generation. I concur. You know, <laughs> not only that, I believe that uh, being the last generation, we're at the footsteps of uh, the Lord coming for us, for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that we're going to be here for another 30 or 50 years. I'm believing that very, very soon the Lord is going to be with us, with his church. And so what I saw around me was current, mm -hmm. was uh, the same dress that we have today, the same people. If it was, let's say, more futuristic, I would have seen that. I would have seen flying cars. I would have probably seen <laughs> other <laughs> things that we haven't seen yet. But no, it's just the same. I saw the train. I saw the yeah. the same things that I see today is what I was seeing. So that's telling me that it's uh, right at the footsteps right now, very soon, very, very soon, because the Lord has already been warning us and now it's not about warning. Now we're walking in what's been in fulfillment. Did you know that the Euphrates River is being dried up? Yes. We talked about that, I think, last yes, time. Yes, we sure and, did. And there are many things that are just happening before our very eyes. All we have to do is search on YouTube what is happening in Israel, for example. <gasps> John, really quickly, have you heard about, I don't know if you've heard about, but there's a young man, he's a Jewish young man and his early to mid thirties who he's performing miracles and rabbis from all over the world in New York are flying over to get his blessings, almost to worship him. This man is not uh, performing miracles. Have you heard of this guy? I've heard of it, yes. Yeah. So we're getting close. We're getting very close. So 
um, and, and, and believe me, they've already got all the material to build the temple. Yeah. And the they've red heifers. Everything. Eh? And, and the they red have, heifers. Yeah. Uh, they're just waiting for the peace covenant and treaty mm -hmm. because they can't do it now. They can't do it because you know how what's happening now. And even Russia, Russia hates Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, these nations, bigger nations, they, they, they want to unite with other nations like Iraq and all that to try and decimate and all these things that are happening against Israel. And yet the Lord has got everything ready for Israel. And this period of time that's coming upon us is uh, Jacob's trouble. And they know, they will know about that because they that's a big reference to the Old Testament. And even the Lord gave much reference in the Old Testament about this period of time that there's never going to be another period like this one of seven years there hasn't been now some thought when hitler was around in second world war that was the tribulation well it could have been like a little taste right of the antichrist yes a little bit of taste but imagine that globally global imagine that global and then taking absolute authority of the world and then but that was a little test. That was a little taste, just like we had the pandemic, you know, and people say, oh, this could be the mark of the beast or they're trying to force us to take this. And where, you know, we had protests and all that. Well, you won't have protests in the tribulation. You, <laughs> you won't be out and you'll, you'll get killed straight away and nobody will say anything. Nobody will. There won't be human rights. There won't be none of that because it's Satan living here on earth with the demons. And, um, uh, but this leader will bring such a convincing solution to our world that the world will be more than happy to be ruled by him. Because uh, the biggest problems we have, one, is the religions around the world, right? That's the biggest thing that's stopping all the religions. I say this is a big issue for the world because, you know, we have so many religions and, and that's a big uh, thing that's stopping the world. So what do they do now? They're unifying and they want to create a one world religion, which I believe uh, even the Pope has already begun to do that with Chrislam and with um, bringing the religions and even lamentably even, and I saw this on YouTube, uh, getting even Pentecostal churches to get on board with this one world religion that they're establishing because that's what they believe that that's a solution just to have one more religion and the antichrist will bring the solution for a one leader one political leader that will bring a solution for the world that can have both the wisdom and the charisma to rule as a leader to bring peace and stability and all of that is a false peace it will be peace but it will be a false peace for a moment the first three and a half years and then all hell breaks loose after that. Mm. But the glory of the Lord is coming. The Lord Jesus is coming in the second coming. And that's going to end up all the Gentile rule from when it started. Yes. And the Lord is going to come as king and savior, but judge to the world. And that's going to be a whole different um, glorious, you know. And, and not only that, the Lord showed me a little bit about the millennium. I had a vision of where he placed me. And it was so awesome where we were going. I was going with people to go and worship the Lord. And the heavens, the sky, it was so different at that time. I could feel the atmosphere of the glory of God all around us in the millennium. And we were all joyful. There was so much peace. And there was an atmosphere where we all wanted to go. We knew, let's go and worship the Lord. He's in Jerusalem. Uh, because that's where the Lord is going to be reigning from, and the nations will come um, and 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 give Him praise and glory when uh, that's going to be happening. And the Lord gave me a little bit of taste of what that feeling will be, and 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 the glory of God was everywhere, everywhere. You could just walk around. You you walk in the atmosphere of heaven, but here on earth, and that's why the the earth will be replenished and will be turned back to its. Uh, like Eden, when the Lord comes, yes, it'll take a few months because of the war and all the, the devastation. Uh, but then um, 
the Lord is going to turn to such a degree where the lion will be able to sit with the lamb <laughs> and they want, and he will not eat the lamb and uh, everything's returning back to where it was in the beginning. And that's because of the, the, um, the millennial reign of Christ. So, and we'll be reigning with him here on earth and transporting ourselves also to the, uh, the new Jerusalem that will be suspended above the earth. Well, we're going to be able to enter there too. So it's going to be wonderful. So John, what would you say to pastors who are hesitant because they're a little fearful to talk about the rapture and the tribulation uh, due to opposition or losing members or, or offering baskets? What would you say to encourage these ministers, these pastors um, to encourage them to preach the full gospel, which includes the tribulation and the rapture of the church. Uh, I think you you said it there yourself too. And any any preacher, that any pastor that's been called by the Lord to pastor and to preach the word of God, they know that we are responsible before the Lord to shepherd the sheep and to uh, teach the word of God all of it in its entirety, from Genesis to Revelation. And and this is something that the Lord uh, has equipped us. That's why so many of us have gone to seminary or Bible college and seminary. We've had the uh, opportunity to learn how to uh, proclaim the word of God, how to study the word of God, how to rightly divide the word of God. And it's our responsibility before our congregation to teach them the word of God. It's not up to us to choose whether we uh, you know, whether we preach about this or that, because we are accountable and the Lord will strictly, uh, you know, deal with us if we have not been diligent in our presentation of the word of God. Now, the question really is, am I going to be a God pleaser or a man pleaser? Paul said, I am not a man pleaser, but a God pleaser in Galatians. And that uh, he wanted to give the whole counsel of the word of God to the church. That is our responsibility. If we don't do that, uh, you know, our congregation suffers and they suffer because they're not being fed correctly. And also they're not being prepared for the coming of the Lord. And I fear that that is happening today in many, many places, many places. And I think the problem is to try, that we're trying to be politically correct the Bible is not about being politically correct. It's about being God-centered and Christ-centered. And as ambassadors of Christ, as pastors and leaders, we need to, more than ever, preach about the second coming of Christ. We need to lead a congregation in preparation for His coming. Because when we do this, this not only really pleases the Lord, but this will bring great fruit in our congregations. If we are flaky preachers, if we are just motivational preachers, this does not honor the Lord at all. Now, there's a place for us to teach and to encourage and to motivate people. Yes, there is. But we are to expound the word of God as preachers. We are to come in and to give, uh, you know, the, 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 the word of God in its entirety. And uh, if you are run by by fear, that's a problem that the pastor has. And that's something that should be challenged by the even the people in the pew. They should challenge when they see that the pastor is scared or how can one of being seen this topic or that topic? You know, I would love for my congregation to tell me it doesn't happen. But if they tell me, pastor, I just told them we're going to be doing this with our connect group the whole year on the book of Revelation. And they were jumping up and down, doing cartwheels in the air. <laughs> and they say, yes, we love it. I said, but listen, don't come just because of curiosity. Come because this is what the Lord has for us. He's going to encourage us. He's going to motivate us. And that means great responsibility for us because when we go through the book of Revelation, that means you've got to be serving more the Lord. you got to put away your excuses. You know, we're really challenging our people, right? And you got to really just say, thank you, Lord, because you've given us the understanding of how things are really going to happen. And because of this understanding, I can go confidently forward 
in my Christian life and I can serve the Lord with all of my heart. You see, just looking at the book of Revelation and, and, and the tribulation, this should not shy us away from preaching it. It should really motivate us as pastors, as leaders, to really teach it in such a way where the Lord wants the result, where I want the same result that the Lord wants. The Lord wants a result for the church to hear what the Spirit of God is saying, apply it, and like I said, build uh, riches in heaven. And to build riches in heaven means to take in souls to heaven, leading souls to Christ, and making sure that that's a priority in our home. I see a lot of parents sometimes coming to church or a husband coming to church and not their wife or a wife coming to church and not their husband. And I often ask, what is going on? What's happening? I ask them, how come your husband is not coming? Well, you know, it's their choice. They got to decide. Or I ask a husband, it's her choice. I said, but you're the leader before the Lord. The Lord is going to ask an account for you as a leader for your home. You've got to motivate your wife and your children to come to the house of the Lord, you know. And then what happens normally is when the children are going through problems and difficulty or rebellion or these things are happening, then they come, please pray for us and this and that. And of course we do. But then we say, hey, if you would have come with your children from the start, this would have been a little bit different to what it is now. And, and and parents, they realize that that's, that's a reality. So I always encourage our congregation, if your wife is not coming, we need to pray for her because the Lord loves her. And it is great that both of you can come to serve the Lord and worship the Lord. You know, a lot of guys are not taking their place as leaders before the Lord in their homes. And even a lot of wives have given up because their husband is at home and doesn't want to come to church. So when I go into the book of Revelation, if this doesn't wake me up <laughs> and, and really gets me to say, come on, husband, you're coming with me. And and uh, and he said, but look, I want to see the footy. I want to see the baseball. I want to do whatever. It says, forget that. You come with me. The Lord is coming soon. And what are you doing there in the couch? You know, come with me right now. We're going to. We're going to serve the Lord together. And I think we need to be very bold in, in this time. We need to be really bold in our prayers. And we need to be a family united together. And, and, and the book will encourage you to do those things. And the pastors need to get back into this. Or else, like one pastor, you know, he was sharing with us that the Lord told him, if you don't preach about this, if you don't preach about the cross, because he was going into motivational speaking all the time, he says, if you don't preach about the cross and my salvation, I will take your ministry away. And he said, when the Lord told him that, boy, that really rectified all his motivational talks. And he said, I had to get back, seriously get back, and begin to focus on winning souls. And then, Building the body of Christ up. You can only build the body of Christ up when you teach all of the word of God. And there's nothing better today to motivate the church than to preach prophecy and the teaching of the second coming of Christ. More than ever. We did it 40 years ago, but it's been winding down and winding down. And we've been listening more to what the world is saying than what the word of God tells us. That's why Christians are more fearful today because they don't. it's not just about not reading the book of Revelation. They're not even actually opening up the Bible. They're just listening to the news and they're fearful and they go for that. And that's because they have forgotten this godly, glorious spiritual manual where the Lord teaches us everything about the end of time and how we should be so on fire for the Lord. I told some people yesterday, you know, in the third world countries, many third world countries, Christians are on fire for God. A full on fire for God. Yes, they may not have finances like we do. They may not have their own houses. They may not have this and that. And some people even say, well, that's because they have fire of God. It says it could be in some cases, but I said, man, if we had the passion and the fire that they have 
we'll be a different nation. And we need to get back to the word of God. And we need to get back. And pastors need to be preaching in the book of Revelation. They need to be doing that. And guess what? More people are going to be coming to your congregation, not less. More, because when the word of God is being declared and you are sharing what the Lord, because people are scared today. People, you know, they're looking around at their nation, the political parties and this and that, and they don't know what's going to happen. Lead them back to the word of God. Don't be scared of, of the reaction of people. It's when you declare the word of God clearly and with conviction that people love that. They're expecting that. They want that. They want leadership. They want, you know, pastors that can encourage them and powerfully pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. When we when we pray and we preach this way, things change. And I've seen it time and time again. Ch uh, churches only, you know, sometimes they die down because there's not much preaching going on. It's just about the cup of tea and the, having a good time and this and that. But when we get back into the Word of God, you're going to get committed Christians, strong Christians. And that is powerful. And I think that's that's what needs to happen today. And uh, and we really need to pray for our pastors so that many of them can wake up and really wake up. And if they're not waking up, the congregation should lift themselves up and encourage their pastors. Pastor, we need this teaching. We need this preaching. You know, and maybe through there, they're, they're going to get the conviction of the Holy Spirit and, and, and preach the word of God. With great conviction, we do that here in our church, you know, and uh, and whenever I get the opportunity to preach, which I do quite often, of course, because we're a team that are preaching, uh, I love it because it's an opportunity that I have to open the Word of God and to declare the coming of the Lord, and to declare how that should affect me today in a positive way, so I can live for the Lord and serve the Lord and be more committed. And by doing that, then I'm going to start seeing results. And we're loving it. It's a great journey. And we're loving that journey. Amen. Amen. And on topic, you have an amazing ebook that's called yes. Get Ready, the King is Coming. Tell us about yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, I've been writing that up because I'm preparing my notes for the book of Revelation. And, and the Lord impressed upon my heart to tell him, get ready. The king is coming. And uh, that's a whole series of things that I show about the signs of the coming of the Lord and how this should prepare me today. Not for 10 more years, not for next year, or think about the future, about today. Today, today, today. Starting today. What I must need and do so I can know that when the Lord comes, he will look at my life and he will say, well done, the good and faithful servants. Yes. And um, I want to encourage all of our viewers. And this is a, this is a free uh, book that you're going to get with two videos. And those two videos are going to be centered upon the Bema seed of Christ. And that's a great topic. That is awesome topic that speaks about the reward place of, of the Lord that he's going to give us rewards for how we have served him here on earth. And this is going to be so exciting that I want to motivate you and encourage you, you know, because even the Lord says he's coming back with his reward and he expects, guess what? He expects, the Lord expects fruit from your life. You're not just going to get to heaven and he's saying, okay, that's it. Just come in. He's expecting that what he has given you, gifts and talents and opportunity and time and your church or your mission field, and he's going to say, I've given you much. Show me what you've done for me, you know, and he will see what you've done for him. Even by giving someone a cup of water with the right motivation as a servant of the Lord, you will be rewarded. How much more if you have been serving the Lord and using your gifts and you may say today, I don't know what my gifts are. Well, you better find out. There are ways that we can find out about our gifts. But I want to leave that with you because it's very, very important that you be equipped. And that's my gift for you for uh, this Christmas <laughs> that's coming up. Uh, get ready. The King is coming. 
with two videos about the being the seed of Christ. And uh, you'll be able to go down on the description, I believe, yes. And they'll be able to see that link in there. It's a Sam Cart link. And you'll be able to get it there. And you'll. Uh, my prayer is that you'll get it and you'll uh, get into it straight away. And uh, ask the Lord, Lord, 2023, it's going to be my year where I'm going to be serving you like never before. Don't limit yourself. The Lord has already given you gifts and talents and abilities and opportunities. You just have to learn to step out and get prepared and train yourself and then serve others. And that's going to be a joy. John Green, this has been amazing, fantastic. And I could never get enough of revelation and hearing about the return of Jesus and the rapture of the church. Yes. So could you pray for those, well, Amen. one for those pastors, that's my, as a big concern, pastors to give them the courage um, to fear God over man, and also to just have the courage to preach the full gospel. And also for those who are hearing this and they're like, I want to be ready. I don't want to be left behind. I don't want to go through this. I love God or, or I want to get to know God so I can love him. Could you just pray for these people who may be confused or who are just ready? And like you said, to equip people, those who want to be equipped. Could you pray for yes. all of that? Amen. Of course I will, Jennifer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your blessed word. We thank you, Lord, for the book of Revelation. We thank you, Lord, because we know that what has been established in heaven will be happening very soon here on earth. And I pray, my Lord, right now, in the mighty name of Jesus, that, Father, you may touch the hearts of your servants, the pastors and leaders there in America and around the world, that you may touch their hearts, Lord, that they may be governed by the Holy Spirit as they walk before you, Lord, in obedience to the calling that you've given them, for them to preach the full gospel, to preach, Lord, the full word of God, that they not be reigned by fear of what people will say or think, or they will not be ruled by, if I preach about these people will give or won't give, but they may be, Lord, with that spirit of Elijah, Lord, that forceful, glorious prophet of the Lord that came with the word of the Lord and declared that word with clarity under the, the unction and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Lord, because our people, your people, the believers in Christ, they need your word to be planted in their hearts, Lord. They need your word to be declared on the pulpits in America and around the world. They need, oh Lord, your word to be declared by the ambassadors, by those whom you have called, Lord. So I pray for all pastors, all leaders, all youth leaders, Lord, all those who are teaching in Sunday school for the children, that they may stand up, Lord, under the power of the Holy Spirit, and they may preach your word, Father, without fear, without doubt, Lord, that they, Lord, during the week may come under your word and may study it, may be trained by it. And, Lord, that then on Sunday or Saturday or Sunday morning, may preach the word, Lord, to the congregation, expecting, oh, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will do a mighty work in the lives of your people, Lord. We need more than ever, Lord, preachers that are going to be under the power of and the control of the Holy Spirit. And we pray, Lord, that you will break away the shackles of fear, Lord. The break away the shackles, Lord. Of those shackles that are holding pastors back. For whatever reason, Lord. Even the fear of politics and the fear of, of man, Lord. That that may be broken away. And they may declare the word of God, Father, today, this weekend that's coming. Lord, so they may bless your people and that your Holy Spirit may grip your children, Lord, with the word of God. And they may be challenged and transformed and they may be serving you, Lord, more than ever, especially in this time, Lord, that we're living. Blessed be your name. 
We thank you, Lord, because we know that you are coming soon. So I pray, Lord, for your church in Latin, in South America, Latin America, in Europe, Lord, in, in Asia, all over the world, Lord, even in Alaska, in North Pole, South Pole, wherever, in the islands, oh Lord, where your word is being preached, Lord. May your Holy Spirit do a mighty work, Lord, as we're coming to the end of this year, even December. May December be a glorious December for your church, Lord, as we declare that the King came, that first coming, he came to save the world. And we pray, Lord, that you may also, in the beginning of 2023, that you may lead every pastor, every leader, every preacher to be stronger and stronger in the Word of God, Lord, to be committed to what the Bible says. And that we may be a voice, an ambassador, like John the Baptist, Lord, who declared the word of the Lord to the kings and to the presidents, Lord. And we pray that this may happen all around our world, in America, in Australia, and everywhere. And I pray for the believers that are hearing us right now, that you may empower them to walk in the Holy Spirit. And they may rejoice that the Lord is coming soon. But you may also encourage us all, Lord, that we may serve you with all of our hearts and for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen and amen. John Green, once again, thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. And to all the audience, may the Lord bless you so much.